because when we designed this program, we were thinking experiential. And um, I hope you enjoyed the tornado warning that we experienced. There's nothing like getting comfortable or uncomfortable with people you've never met before for an entire year of courageous conversations in the basement of Barrington's White House. <laughs> so hopefully you are warmed up and ready to go because I know that we certainly are on the Courageous Conversations team. Good evening, welcome to a year of Courageous Conversations in which together we explore how to foster greater inclusion and belonging in our community. I'm Jessica Green, your co-host for the series and along with Zena Jacques, Claire Nelson and our Courageous Conversations team, we want to thank you for responding to the call and are honored that you are here to begin this journey with tonight's first topic of 10, Defining Courage. We just did that in the basement. <laughs> Registration for the 2020 portion of the sessions open this Friday. You will all receive an email reminder with a link to the registration website. We hope that you will come along for the entire journey. So we encourage you to please register for the 2020 sessions immediately. Participation is limited and seats do fill up quickly. You may have noticed the video camera in the room and we want to assure you that for the sake of privacy, only the presentation parts of the evening will be recorded further honoring one another and in an effort to create space for honest sharing, we ask that as individuals in the room share their stories, please treat this information as sacred and let it remain with you upon leaving. Thank you. Producing this series has been a true team effort and we would be remiss not to acknowledge Barrington's White House, Barrington Area Library, Be Strong Together, Barrington Area Community Foundation, BMO Harris Wealth Management, Sue and Rich Padula, Kim Duchessois, and Urban Consulate for their partnership on this journey. We are, th okay, yes, thank you. We are thrilled to welcome tonight's guest expert, Dr. Aaron Reeves. Aaron is a leading researcher, author, and advisor in the fields of leadership and inclusion. For over 20 years, she has delivered dynamic and thought-provoking messages to inspire and activate change for audiences across the world. Blending her diverse backgrounds as a lawyer, a researcher, an academic, an author, and a consultant to organizations ranging from Fortune 500 companies to hospitals and governments, she speaks on many forms of difference, including racial and ethnic, gender, generational, religious, sexual orientation, identity and expression, physical abilities, cognitive style, which I'm really interested in because that's like crazy in my family, and <laughs> cultural difference. She is the best-selling author of three books, The Next IQ, One Size Never Fits All, and Smarter Than a Lie. Erin is also president of the Chicago-based research and advisory firm, Nections. But first, we need to introduce our convener in chief for the evening, Dr. Reverend Zina Jacques has been bringing her wise leadership to our community for the past 13 years, serving as pastor of Barrington's Community Church. Zina serves on numerous local and national boards and herself is a national speaker in demand. This summer, she even took the pulpit for the second week at the legendary Chautauqua Institute. But always a model of humility, Zina wouldn't tell you that herself. Instead, she would direct you to look at the nameplate that sits on the edge of her desk, which says, Chief Student. It is as a lifelong learner with which Zina identifies most. So Zina, please come and lead us down the path of wonder and curiosity tonight. Perfect. <laughs> My friends, we gather on a day um, that we hope will never be repeated. We gather in the shadow still of 9-11. Storm clouds were gathering then, and they're gathering now. But I come of age in a, a faith that has a song, and the words are, encourage my soul and let's journey on. The night is, far, the night is dark and we are far from home, but thanks be, the morning light appears. The storm is passing over. 
The storm is passing over when men and women stand up and are willing to be courageous, to engage with difference, to not be afraid of the grist of learning and of gathering data that's different than theirs. We set a table and you had nerve enough to accept the invitation. <laughs> we said, that's right, that's right. We set a table and we really didn't tell you what the menu was. <laughs> but I can tell you what's not served at this table. What's not served at this table is winning and convincing and persuading and cajoling. What is not served at this table is I've got the only right way. What's not served at this table is I'm gonna take my marbles and go home. Instead, what's served at this table are grounding virtues adventurous civility and hospitality and generous listening and patience and humility and words that matter. What's served at this table is, is, is the willingness to stay curious. It's the willingness to, to lean in. It's the willingness to hear one another. What's served at this table is actually on your table. You have all of these intentions about staying curious and getting uncomfortable. That was downstairs in the basement, by the way. <laughs> staying hopeful that we would get back upstairs. You've already practiced this whole page. <laughs> what's, what's served at this table are guidelines that speak from I statements and hear the other and, and, and make space for the voices and, and know that we're all learning. What's served at this table and in this room is a space where we care for one another. And what's served at this table is a willingness to get proximate to get close to what is not your own way of thinking, to be present, to suspend judgment. What's served at this table is authentic openness to learn and to grow. We didn't tell you what the menu was, but you came anyway. We thank you for trusting us. We thank you for joining in this amazing journey of courageous conversations. And we want you to do something for us. We want you to honor this room and what you learn here. Anything you learn here, you are welcome to take out. But what you hear from your brothers and sisters and fellow citizens about their private stories, about those confidential things, that stays here. Learning goes out, but the stories and the confidences stay here. You heard the sirens a moment ago. And even if you didn't hear them, the moment someone told you the sirens were blaring, we moved into action. My friends, there are sirens right now in our nation and in our world. And my heart is singing because you've chosen to take action and there are 85 people on the wait list who wanted to be here, but you are the chosen ones. <laughs> to whom much is given, much is required. Thank you. Come fully into this space open, ready to be challenged, ready to learn. Come fully into this space, willing to be transformed. The morning lot appears. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Dr. Aaron Reeves, we are in your more than capable hands. Awesome, so thank you all. Um, I've never been to a party where the start was that phenomenal, so um, I actually think we can just go home right now and you've already learned a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. So, I'm just so grateful to be invited to be a part of this conversation. I want to say a couple of things before we start, right? One is, I am not an expert in your experience. I am not an expert in anything that you have thought about. I am not an ex expert in how you feel, how you listen to each other. Um, I am not, and people sometimes say, well, Erin, you're an expert in diversity, and I say, no, I'm not. I'm an expert in helping people 
see the diverse thoughts in their own heads. But I am not an expert in your thoughts, right? I'm going to guide you through a process today, but you're not gonna learn half as much from me or, as you are from each other, um, which is why you are in table settings, um, which is why we took you to the basement so you could, you know, <laughs> used to be in close to each other. Um, I just wanna make sure this is, all right, so we're gonna start, we're gonna, you know, there's a lot when we start talking about diversity, people go, are we gonna talk about race? Are we gonna talk about gender? Are we gonna talk about disabilities? What are we gonna talk about, right? So I wanna give you a couple of examples because my background is I'm a lawyer in recovery. Um, I am also, uh, but m the majority of my training that brings me here is I'm a neurobehavioral sociologist, right? Um, so I study how brains work, I study how people think. So I wanna start by why are we starting with courage? So I'm gonna ask you some questions that are not gonna seem like it has anything to do with today, but I swear to you, I will pull it all together. And if I don't, raise your hand and say, Aaron, that made no sense. Um, raise your hand if you have the same thing for breakfast every morning. You're closest, I'm gonna pick on you. What do you have? Uh, oatmeal. Oatmeal. Yeah. Do you eat oatmeal in the same place? Is it at home? OK, but is it the same oatmeal? Yes. OK, so let's say that we took you and we hooked you up to an fMRI machine, right? And we said, what's your name? Stephanie. Stephanie. We said, Stephanie, what do you eat for breakfast every morning? And you would say, oatmeal. And the pleasure centers in your brain would light up, right? Because it isn't just that you like your oatmeal. It's that you can see the oatmeal. You can see how you get it. You can see how you prepare it. You know how you sit down. You know the type of spoon that you use. So as you're thinking about this, your brain is like all kinds of pleasure juices all over the brain. And you are going to get happier and happier and calmer and more peaceful as you talk about this oatmeal. <laughs> now suddenly, someone's going to say to you, Stephanie, today you don't get to have oatmeal. We're going to make you eat bacon, right? The part of the brain that's going to go, no, I'm not. You can't make me. You, no, I don't know, right? The part of the brain that lights up if someone says, you're not going to do what you get to do every day, is the part of the brain that governs fear. And what's interesting is, starting in children who are six months old, if you take away a six-month-old's toy, or if you show them people who have a different skin color than the people that they're growing up with, it's the exact same part of the brain that lights up, right? So who knew racism and oatmeal had so much in common? Um, but so our brain isn't responding to race. It's not responding to gender. It's not responding to people who love differently than us. It's not responding to people who worship differently than us. It's just responding to difference. And our brain loves Right? When we talk about, you've all heard of this concept of implicit bias. Status quo bias is the strongest bias in human beings. We are going to fight tooth and nail to do tomorrow exactly like we did today. Why? Because it's easy, but more because we get so much pleasure from the comfort of knowing exactly what it's going to play like. So part of what we want to do when we start talking about diversity is we want to dismantle all of the mythology and the heaviness and the stuff that we've built up around race, around gender, around sexual orientation, these identities. The bottom line is the identities matter because they're causing us to treat each other in ways that are not consistent with our intentions. But I want you, over the course of the day-to-day, -to, -day, to not focus on the identities, but just focus on the difference, right? I'm going to keep picking on Stephanie, but think about the fact that there's something you do every single day. 85% of your thoughts every single day, by the way, are not thoughts. They're just memories of old thoughts that you had, right? 85%. And the reason our brain does this is because it feels good. So one way to think about fear is it makes us scared. Another way to think about fear is it's just what we don't know, right? And our brain treats what we don't know and what actually scares us as exactly the same way from a neurological perspective. Now, that is not to suggest there aren't serial social considerations and interpersonal considerations and conversations. We are not going to have a conversation like this about oatmeal versus bacon, obviously. Or if you want to, we can. But 
this thing that we haven't examined is causing us to see differences where maybe there aren't any. And it's causing us to treat each other different in a way that is completely, and I believe this with all my heart, it is not consistent with our intentions. I am one of those people that believe that the majority of human beings in this world intend to be kind to other people, right? But now I'm gonna ask you another question that may not seem to make sense. Raise your hand if you've ever made a New Year's resolution. I'm not gonna ask you what it is. People are like, why am I telling you this, right? Now raise your hand if you've made more than one New Year's resolution. Now, stand up if you've kept all of your New Year's resolutions. <laughs> right? No one? I've not met one person yet. Actually, one person, but I think they were lying. Um, <laughs> so why do we do this? Every December, every December, 70% of United States adults say, I'm going to be a better person. I'm gonna be healthier, I'm gonna be kinder, I'm not gonna scream at my kids, I'm gonna drive better, I'm gonna do something because I've decided it's gonna make me a better person. And what do we do? We research it, we tell other people this is what I'm gonna do, right? We may even buy gym memberships, <laughs> we may buy new shoes, new clothes, we may even drive past the gym so we know where it is. <laughs> But by January 31st of the next year, 96% of people in the United States are no longer actively working on all their New Year's resolutions, right? How is that relevant to inclusion? Because human beings don't do what we say we're gonna do. We do not, our actions do not line up with our intentions unless we are very deliberate and specific about it. And believe it or not, the number one thing between you and the accomplishment of your resolutions is actually fear. We don't define it that way, but that is what it is. So that's where we're gonna start. Um, this is supposed to look really scary, right? <laughs> fear, the power of fear. So I want you to start thinking about three things that scare the mess out of you, right? So I wanna talk to you a little bit about what fear is. So what do we feel when we're scared? Our body reacts, right? Our stomachs get upset. Our heart starts racing. Our palms start sweating, right? We may suddenly feel like we're breathing faster. There are things in each of our lives, in each of our lives, that the minute we think about that thing and the fear gets activated, our body responds. So I wanna talk you through some of the most common fears in human beings. Now I just want you to stand up because we're gonna move around a little bit. If this fear applies to you, no one's gonna share anything from this room, so no one's gonna run out and tell people what you're scared of, <laughs> all right? But these are the most common fears that human beings have. Fear of open spaces. Ah, you see, the people are like, what? Yes, fear of open spaces. So imagine yourself in a field that's just bare. Anyone scared of that? I know, I'm from, <laughs> you know, and I gotta tell you, I live downtown, I live by Millennium Park, right? I live downtown Chicago, and I was like, of course. Like, where do, where do you go, right? Like, what do, what do you do if you're hungry? Like, I had all these questions, but see how much I'm learning from y'all already? Fear of heights. Stand up if you're scared of heights. All right. Okay, sit back down. Fear of flying. Okay, all right. Fear of spiders. <laughs> you see people's faces are like, Aaron, stop. Okay, I should have had a trigger warning at the beginning of this. Fear of snakes. All right. This one's a little gross, and I'm sorry. Fear of blood and bodily fluids of other people. Okay, people got that, all right. Fear of enclosed spaces. See, that doesn't scare me, but okay. My suburban friends are standing up, awesome, all right. This was on my list before the, tor the tornado warning happened, but fear of storms. 
Okay? Look at the courage you all are already expressing by just standing up for this. Fear of needles. <laughs> okay. Fear of public speaking. Just, these are all the people who are going to speak at the next event. <laughs> Fear of insects other than spiders. It's a whole category by itself. Spiders is one category, and then all other bugs are another category. So fear of, in okay. Fear of water. All right, okay. Water. We all have different images in our minds. I don't think anyone's scared of drinking a glass of water. Well, we know water is different. Fear of the dark. Okay. Fear of rejection. <laughs> All right. OK. So I want you to think about these fears. You can use some of these fears that I've talked about. You can use some of your own. But I do want you to take a little bit of time and write down these fears. Write down three fears, things that really that you're scared of. But, 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 before you start writing, I want to tell you something about how we define fear that makes this list make no sense, OK? When we say fear of heights, nobody in this room who stood up is actually scared of heights. What are you actually scared of? Aww. Thank you, right? One of the tricks that our brain plays on us, which is why when you write down your fears, I don't want you to write down the type of list I just said, because nobody is scared of heights. People are scared of plummeting from huge heights down to the ground and dying in the process, right? Nobody is scared of spiders, but people are scared of what? Biting, getting bit, seeing it, having to interact with it, deal with it. Nobody is scared of flying. People are scared of the plane crashing, right? So one of the ways that our brain actually plays a trick on us about fear is we socially have named fears as not the thing we're actually scared of. So you all stood up. Nobody is actually scared of water, but people are scared of drowning. So when you start thinking about your fears, I want you to write what you're actually scared of. Don't use the terminology I did. I did this as a little bit of a trick. Because you all knew what I meant and you stood up. But think about that for a second. No one's scared of flying. I would love to fly. I just want to make sure I come back down OK, right? I'm not scared of spiders as long as they're in another state <laughs> far away from me. Um, no one's scared of enclosed spaces. They're scared of losing oxygen. They're scared of not being able to breathe. You're not scared of the dark. You're scared of not knowing what's around you. You're scared of not being able to see what could hurt you. The reason that it's important to take the time to say, what am I really scared of? is because it is the thing you don't want to see happen. It is the thing you're pushing away. It may not seem like it has to do with diversity, but I promise you, the practice of starting to say, this is what I'm scared of, teaches your brain that it doesn't tell you what you're scared of. You get to have a conversation with it. It says, eh, room is dark. And you're like, we're not scared of the dark. We're scared of all the stuff that could be there that we can't see, right? You know, this is a way to start conversing with your brain about your fears. So take a second. And then what we're going to do is um, you don't have to share your fears. But if you would like to, without your name, um, write it down on the cards that are at your table. And just hold up the card. And we will have magic people walking around. And we're going to grab a couple of the cards just so you can read what your, uh, what your brothers and sisters wrote as well. OK, as they're coming up, some of the things are, I'm afraid of cancer. But they really did go through and say, dying, actually leaving my family, right? Fear of rejection. It really is the fear of getting into a relationship, being held accountable. And when people say, I'm afraid of rejection, what they mean is, someone else isn't going to think I'm OK. Someone else, else isn't going to think I'm worth it. 
right? Um, suffocation, that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> um, loneliness or sadness, right? Loneliness or sadness, um, being alone, infected with venom. Snakes, I appreciate the detail. Um, rejected, family dying, which is kind of the opposite of you dying. It's watching your family die, that's, that's really scary. You all are some volunteering people, okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna make sure they have this list because these kinds of things are great to keep as kind of, we'll type up a list and make sure you have it. Um, fear of something happening to children or a spouse. Being unloved, being not noticed, right? Which goes to that part of self-worth. What if someone looks at me and gets to know me and then leaves, right? What if I really show who I am and they say, no, thank you, right? That's a very, very deep fear that people have. Thank you all for sharing this amazing, amazing honesty. Um, afraid of loss and pain, destruction, disappearing, that's a great one. Afraid of disappearing, afraid of not mattering, right? Fear of disappointing the people that I love. Um, what I can't see in the dark, the loss of control, right? So I'm gonna go back over this list that I, that I gave you guys, um, but we're gonna actually start talking about what happens in your brain when you are afraid. So let's take a look at these two pictures. What's the picture on your left? What's the picture on your right? A rope. A rope. So here's how the human brain evolved. We are the descendants of the most scaredy cat of our ancestors, right? Why? Because stop and think about it, right? Let's say, oops, let's say that 1,000 years ago, two people were walking down a road, right? And they saw this. One of the people said, huh. I wonder what that is. Another person said, I don't care, I'm running, right? Because I'm not curious enough about that because it looks too much like something that can kill me. So one person runs, the other person goes and says, oh, but I'm curious, I'm gonna examine this. Nine times out of 10, they may be right, it might be a rope, but that 10th time the snake will catch them and they dead, which means they don't reproduce, <laughs> right? So the people who reproduced, I'm telling you, we are, we are, the, our legacy is the scariest cat of our ancestors. Because the people who reproduced are the ones who were like, why do we care if it's a rope? It looks just enough like a snake. I'm going home, good luck, right? So the way that your human brain works, all of our brains are hardwired in this way. So one way to think about it is we talk about the low road and the high road, right? The low road to a response, and the response is like your stomach upset, you run, you yell, you scream, all the things that we talked about with fear. The, the low road is as soon as you see it, you run. Because your brain is like, we don't care. We are not curious. We don't want to figure this out. The high road is, huh. What is that? You know? It could be a rope. Now, that rope might be the thing that made this person very successful. It, they might be, you know, the Bill Gates of the thousand years ago. Who knows what that rope could do for someone's life? But all you have to do is be wrong once, and you never get to reproduce. So your curiosity did not get passed along as much as the person who followed the low rope. So most of our brain mechanism is actually coming from the people who took the low road, more so than the high road. Now you fast forward human evolution. We have so many tools now. We can tell and we can explore and we can do this. So we actually have the opportunity to travel the high road so much more, but our brains have not evolved to operate in that way. Whether it is you eat oatmeal, whether you see people of a different race, whether you see something that you've never seen before, 
most of us, most of our brains, very much will see something and quickly say, nah, I'll see y'all later, right? So raise your hands if you, were, if you were scared of snakes. All right, now all of you who are scared of snakes, how many of you have actually touched a real snake? Anybody who's scared of a snake actually touched a snake? Okay, all right. Well, what did you experience when you touched the snake? Okay, so, okay, so, but think about what you did in that situation, right? Your brain was like, do not touch the snake. And your stomach was like, I swear I'm going to let go of everything that is in here. Do not do this, right? So the low road was calling you. It was saying, we don't do this. Like, this is a really stupid idea. But what you just showed was what courage looks like. Courage is when we skip the low road and we say, hmm, I know that's what I should be doing, but that is not what I will choose to do. The minute you start defining your fears as you did in that previous exercise, and then you start choosing, like I know I'm going to run right now. I know I feel whatever the fear is. I feel the fear of rejection. I feel, I just feel the fear of being uncomfortable. What if I offend somebody if I say something? What if they think I'm stupid? What if they think that, you know, I'm the stupid person they should avoid for the rest of their lives? All of these thoughts go through our head. That is you thinking, I don't know if it's a rope or a snake, but it could be a snake, so let me just treat it like it's a snake. I will just avoid the conversation. I will avoid the question. I will avoid the people who look different from me. Right? So the same process is at work. And then think about these fears, right? These are human fears, regardless of whether people have ever experienced this. Right? Fear of open spaces. Why is that something that has become part of our evolution? Because fear of open spaces means there might not be someone around to help us if we need it. Fear of open spaces is actually a fear of abandonment. It's a fear of loneliness. It's a fear of I don't have support. Fear of heights, right? There were two people on a mountain somewhere. One said, let's go see what's there. The other one said, I'm going home, because that looks dangerous. And they passed that on to all of us, right? Um, fear of flying, fear of spiders, because the two things that are pretty much generalized to every culture that killed the most human beings, especially way back in the day, were spiders and snakes. So children as young as three months old show a fear of spiders and snakes, even if they've never seen one, right? Why? Because their brain is like, we don't care what it is. Don't explain it. I will see it in a zoo with a very law, you know, large glass cage. But there's no reason for me to get to know that thing, right? Fear of enclosed spaces is fear of suffocation. Fear of storms is people died in storms. Fear of water is fear of drowning. That was one of the most common ways that human beings died thousands of years ago, right? Fear of needles, I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, <laughs> I think just pokey things, maybe. Um, fear of the dark, you are more likely to get killed in the dark. I mean, think about all these fears that have deep evolutionary meanings for us. That's also where our fear of people who look different from us comes into play. Thousands of years ago, if we walked down the street and if we saw someone who looked different from us, chances were really high they did not have our best interests at heart. Over the course of human evolution, human brains understood seeking similarity had a higher probability of safety than seeking difference. Our world has changed, right? But our brains haven't yet changed. Our brains take quite a while to change. So our evolutionary model and our social expectations right now haven't yet matched up. Because of that, we have to deliberately match it. So I want to tell you this super sad story about a little baby named Albert. Albert was nine months old when Dr. John Watson decided to experiment on Albert. This was a long time ago, and thankfully, people can't do this anymore. However, 
we did learn a lot, so we can still take the lessons, although we should never do this to babies. So that's Albert. First time, and these are actual pictures of Albert, right? So on the left-hand side is the first time Albert saw a white mouse. He petted it. He laughed with it. He was nine months old. He played with it, right? So Dr. John Watson got a great idea. He said, well, what if the next time I clang a big bell in the background while he touches this white mouse? This is something called conditioned fear. What we've talked about until now is what we call non-conditioned fear, right? It's instinctive fear. So fear of snakes is not conditioned. We've ne we never need to see a snake in our lives in order to be scared to death of snakes. We never need to have fallen out of an airplane to be scared of flying, right? We never need to actually have suffocated to be scared of small spaces. These are what are called instinctive fears. This is an example of a conditioned fear. So what they started doing, Dr. Watson and his assistant, is they would literally show Albert the mouse and ring this huge bell in the background. So Albert would be like, oh my god, right? And eventually, Albert got scared of the mouse. So as soon as he saw the mouse, kind of like a Pavlovian response, he was like, I don't like the mouse. But here's the thing that out of this research that was the most profound of it. They kept doing it. They did it for two more months. After Albert was like, please get the mouse away from me in his nine-month-old language, they still kept doing it. Eventually, Albert decided anything that was white was scary. I know. By the time Albert was a year old, he was scared of Santa Claus, which is that picture. Dr. Watson put on a Santa beard, and Albert cried for six hours. I know, I told you it was a sad story, but we learned a lot from it. I know, it's terrible. I shouldn't be <coughs> thanking the lessons, but thank Albert. Everybody say, thank you, Albert. <laughs> All right. So conditioned responses are the second type of fear that we have, right? So the first is we can't help it. The second is when we've taken things like <coughs> our fear of getting hurt, and then we attach it to something else. Right? So when you ask parents, what are you scared that's going to happen to your kids? What is the number one thing that parents say? They're going to get kidnapped. Right? They're going to get kidnapped. That's the number one thing that parents do is protect their children from getting kidnapped. Do you know what the number one cause of death is for children under three? Drowning in a bathtub. Think about how you feel as a parent if you don't get home in time and your child is by themselves, but think about how often you're like, they're in the bath, they're fine, right? So we've been conditioned to fear that stranger that's gonna come get our children, but the actual fear we should be scared to death of is leaving them for three seconds on their own in the bathtub. So conditioned fear comes out of repeated exposure to media narratives and false cause and effect. Right? So let's take a racial example. The percentage of African Americans who are shown as committing crimes are 23 times the percentage of African Americans actually committing crimes. Right? And so it's Albert and Santa Claus. We've learned to associate things that don't go together. The percentage of Caucasian people committing crimes and us seeing them committing crimes is 136th, right? So, but what is the fear there? The fear isn't of black people, which is sometimes when we talk about racism, we talk about, well, is the fear of black people, is the fear that women are in the workplace? No, it's not. It's the fear, all the fears that you guys wrote down, it's the fear of getting hurt, it's the fear of your family getting hurt, it's the fear of being abandoned, it's all these fears over the course of time, like baby Albert, got associated with things that had nothing to do with each other. That's what we call false cause and effect. Lack of exposure to facts, right? So once what happens is baby Albert, I doubt ever liked Santa Claus, because this was very early in his cognitive development that this fear was formed, right? So over the course of baby Albert's life, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure he avoided Santa Claus. He avoided white stuffed animals. By the time he was one, you could not show him a picture of a cloud without him crying. So 
what, he, what is he not going to do? He's not going to go explore clouds. He's not going to go talk to a Santa Claus, right? He's not going to go up to a Santa Claus and pull on their beard. He's not going to play with the white stuffed animal. So the minute the, the false cause and effect gets triggered, what we do is we stay away from it. So we then prevent the facts getting into our head to actually even have a shot of undoing some of the association. Now in the United States, associations about anything that is visually different between us is solidified by the age of three. By the age of three, right? Which means by three, children have very gendered perceptions of professions. Children by the age of three attribute more positive characteristics to lighter skin and more negative characteristics to darker skin. Children by the age of three see people who may look different from us, right? They may have, for example, a prosthetic limb or something, and they say, what's wrong with you, right? They don't mean to be mean. What they're saying is, I know what normal is, and this isn't it, so you have to explain to me why you're not normal. Um, so now we're avoiding facts because our fears have been triggered, and we're all, right, we're all came from that ancestor who was like, I don't need to know the truth, I just want to be safe. Um, now we're going to not talk about it. Why the heck would we talk about what we're scared of, right? Which is why when we talk about a courageous conversation, just showing up to talk about courage and fear is courage itself. And then being you know, told to go to the basement, then come back <laughs> up. And you're like, I'm going to flow with this, OK. Um, so then we lack critical dialogues. We become closed to questions because it's so much easier. right? It feels safer if no new information comes in. Yeah, we can kind of say, yeah, maybe I'll explore it one day. But for right now, today, I don't have time. I don't have the energy. Um, and we start avoiding the discomfort. And as we grow older, literally things that we have processed and absorbed as a nine-month-old, a 10-month-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, have become the circuitry in our brains that we're then making sure all other experiences fit into. So we will avoid the experiences that at two, when we're not even aware, we created a circuitry of no thank you. And then too much stuff. So I call this stuff, right, um, in my research. And it's basically um, stress, time constraints, uncertainty, fatigue, or fear. When any one of these five things are in effect at any time, your brain is actually going to go back to its unconscious circuitry. Because you're using up, think about like if you're really about to go to the bathroom. right? You got up from your desk at work, you were about to go to the bathroom, and that's when a coworker decided to come ask a question. And you're sitting there going, I really don't care, whatever. Like, I don't want to have this conversation with you. I don't care what the answer is. Can we just talk about it in five minutes? Because it's not fully polite to say, I got to go pee. So you're, you're like, can we, like, there's just this discomfort. Or rem imagine if you're hungry. And that's when someone says, can I talk to you about something serious? And you're like, no. <laughs> right? Not because you don't care, but because your brain cognitive resources are being pulled in a completely different way. So one of the things about courage is, and the reason that I always add this stuff is, be patient with yourself as you work on this courage muscle. It's OK to not be courageous on a day where you're super tired. It's OK to not think about courage when you're sick, right? Because you don't have the energy. So there's no point in holding yourself to a standard of trying to practice something that your brain may just not have the energy for. So you want to think about courage, and you want to think about fear, but you want to think about it. And you have to know it's easier to be courageous in the morning than it is in the afternoon. We are all start our days with a certain amount of cognitive energy. And as we use it up, we get more our unconscious selves over the course of the day. Right? So at 8 o'clock in the morning, there's a chance we're like, is that a rope or a snake? At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we're like, we really don't care. I want my coffee. I want a cookie. And that's a snake. Right, And so you don't want to do, when you start thinking about fear and courage, especially across differences, you want to be conscious of that last point. Does anybody have any questions about the neurology of it? Because I'm going to shift to kind of the courage piece of it um, and want to make sure that any questions that you have are answered before we go on. Is there a question? Oh, my 
my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Did you hear what she said? Her fear is rodents. And she's like, are there going to be any more pictures? Why didn't you tell me that like two minutes ago? You could have been like, I can still hear you, Erin. Can you go to the next slot? Oh, man. I needed a trigger warning for that slide, too. OK. Um, but yes, please, that's a very important. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so what is the power of courage, right? So we've already talked about the low road and the high road. Low road is fear without your intervention. The high road is never a lack of fear. It is the presence of fear and a conscious decision to act in spite of it, right? And we've heard all of those quotes. I don't believe in the word fearless. There is no such thing as fearless, right? Maybe after you're dead. But there's no such thing as a human being who is alive, who's interacting with the world around them, that has the absence of fear. Because you can't have courage if you don't have fear right underneath it, right? Like from a conscious, like just a pure cognitive perspective, so what I want you to do now is you can actually use the example of, I told the speaker to move the slide because she was scaring me with that picture of a road. Um, think of a time you were really brave. Think of a time when you felt all that stuff that we just talked about, your stomach, your all of this stuff, right? Like your everything was like, I can't, I can't, I can't, but you did it anyway. Every single person has at least one time in our lives that we did that. Don't look for some um, you know, huge instance. It can be something small. Right? I'm scared to death of spiders. And a couple of days ago, both my children, my son is six foot one and my daughter is five foot ten and a half, and they both decided today was the day they were incapable of killing the spider, and they were just screaming at the top of their lungs. And we live in a four floor townhouse, so they're on the top floor, so they're like running around. It sounds like there's a herd of elephants up there. And I just went up, smashed the spider with my hand, wiped it off, and was like, please go to bed, and went back, right? <laughs> So I don't know if I was brave or just upset or sleepy, but at that moment, what I did was the low road was like, remember, you're scared of spiders. The high road was like, they need to shut up. <laughs> and so we need to do this, because you're more capable of this than them. So it can be something that's silly, right? But now, I don't want you to just think about courage and just write it on a card. I want you to think about just one time when you were really courageous, and I want you to talk to the people at the table about it. This was a moment when I was courageous, right? Which means, as part of saying, this was a moment I was courageous, I do want you to say, because this is something that I'm actually really afraid of. OK? Thank you all so much. So up until now, um, what we've talked about is kind of what is fear, and I do want you to differentiate between what we call an instinctive fear and a conditioned fear, right? So when you start saying, I'm afraid, say, was it one of those instinctive fears that Aaron talked about? Or how did I get to be scared of this? Somewhere along your life, someone attached, which is what a fear of public speaking is. We attached public speaking to rejection, right? A six-month-old knows how to tell you they don't want to be rejected. But a six-month-old hasn't associated it with public speaking yet, right? A two-year-old hasn't associated it yet with asking someone to homecoming. And so as we get older, we take all of these things, false causes and effects, and we then attach them to more instinctive fears. So one of the most powerful things you can leave here and just ask yourself the next time you're afraid is, what's the actual fear and what did I actually attach it to? So one other way to think about it is we just want to avoid the low road, right? And every single one of you, by just thinking about the examples that you've shared at your table, have al you've already proven to yourself that you know how to do it. Uh, now the goal is when you meet that person who's really different from you and you don't want to offend them, it, that same courage. It's the same muscle, right? It's kind of like our hands. Like we can do a lot of different things with these fingers, but the fingers don't move any differently. We can just use them for lots of different things. 
So a couple of things to think about. Um, and fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision, right? A reaction is something you don't have any control over. A decision is something you always have control over. Um, another way to think about it is courage is fear holding on just a tad bit longer, right? And there's a lot of times I've practiced that where I get really scared of something and I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna sit here and be scared. And eventually you will get tired of just sitting there and being scared. Just holding on a little longer, what you're doing is when you just say, I'm not gonna react in the moment, you're giving your brain a chance to use the muscle it already knows that it can. So I want to, I want to leave you with, um, as I ask Sina to come up here, um, this is one of my favorite quotes by um, Brene Brown, you can choose courage or you can choose comfort, right? <coughs> but you cannot have both, bless you. Um, so what does it mean to choose comfort? It's a little bit tricky of a, for, for, you're not always choosing comfort, you're defaulting to comfort. Here's the thing, like I've heard, someone once told me, everything that's fun in your life lies outside of your comfort zone, right? Everything that you really enjoy that's really fun, walking across the thing at the Grand Canyon, which I'm not sure I could do, but all of these things exist outside the, at the edge of your comfort zone. So what I want you to do is you just sort of sit and think for a second, and you don't have to share this, is what are some places you can choose courage, right? And I'll give you um, a couple of things from my own life that, that I've had to choose recently. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, you know, I, I went to the doctor, and I think I know more than any doctor because I'm a doctor, even though it's not an MD. Uh, but you know, I'm like, so he said, Aaron, you need surgery, and I was like, why? And he said, because this is what you need. And I was like, what are some other ways we could do this? He's like, there are no other ways. Like, you need surgery. And I was like, no, I don't, right? And I was like, we'll talk about this later. Let me go research it, because I'm not sure you know all of the stuff that you're supposed to know. And plus, I haven't looked this up on WebMD yet, so I don't even know what you're saying, right? So I went home, and this is the power of having a community. My immediate thought was, I don't need the surgery, right? But that was the low road, right? What I wasn't admitting to myself is I'm scared. And I have no idea, like, what if, this is bad, like what, you know, my kids just have a freshman in high school, have a senior in high school, we've got college. And I didn't even think about all that. I just said, I know more than him. Because sometimes fear doesn't show up as scared, it shows up as arrogance. It shows up as I know better. That's how mine usually shows up anyway. And so I went home and, you know, my best friend called me and she said, you know, so what did the doctor say? I said some stupid stuff about some surgery. I'm, and she's like, Aaron, what's scaring you? Like, what scared you? And the minute she said that, I stopped, and all the fear actually came to the table, right? I was scared. And the minute I did that, I said, okay, I'm scared. What am I scared of? Then, I, you know, I, the process that I just put in place today for you all is I had to say, what am I scared of? I'm not scared of the surgery. I'm scared of not waking up from the surgery, right? I'm scared of coming home and not having the energy to be with my kids. I'm scared of all of these other things. And I started writing it down. And the minute you start naming it, each one of those things had a solution. I can make sure so-and-so is there for this. I can make sure I, you know, my team at work knows what's going on. And then it became less about the reaction that I had and a lot more about the decision that I could make. So sometimes just that little bitty thing of saying, what am I scared of? You start listing it, the solutions also show up. And so we have all of these stories in all of our lives, um, but at the end of this journey, we don't wanna lose sight of the fact that we also wanna apply it to some of the scariest things we're facing in our culture today, um, which is we've decided we're so different from each other that we have to be scared to death of each other. And the truth is, we're not that different from each other. All of our fears are very similar. All of our courage muscles are very similar. We just gotta get into the habit of using it together and using it more in a communal sense 
like today. So as we go through this process, um, I hope you have a lot more opportunities to kind of think about how you can use it. And then also my challenge to you today is, and I know Zena's gonna give you a couple of other challenges. My challenge to you is today, talk to one person tonight that wasn't in this room and say, I had this conversation, I had to go to the basement, but after that, <laughs> this is one thing I learned that I actually think I'm gonna use, right? Because the minute you have the courage to share it with someone else, you are not only using your muscle, but now you're teaching someone else to do it as well. So any questions about anything that we've covered today? Awesome, thank you all so much. Yeah. Okay. There's a buzz in Barrington about this thing. So people are going to query you if, you know, if they know you were here. So I love Dr. Aaron's challenge, Aaron's challenge. What will you tell the person who says, so what did you do? I'm, I'm serious. What will you tell them? Would you take just 60 seconds and somewhere in your notes, finish this sentence? I want you to know this about last night meaning somebody asks you tomorrow. I want you to know this. 60 seconds, what do you want them to know? You are now armed and ready to respond. My friends, we said we'd set a table and that a meal was going to be served. Would you join me in thanking the master chef who prepared and fed us this meal this night, Aaron Reeves. Amazing. So in my house, my husband won't eat leftovers. If you call them leftovers, he will not eat them. We have to call them snacks <laughs> or another bite. So I want you to know that this meal has another bite. If you sign up for the website, CourageousConversations.us, you will have access to a recap of this evening. Someone took notes for you. If you sign up for the website, you'll know when we're ready to push out the video. If you sign up for the website, you'll have an opportunity to see some of the resources that are on the table, and you'll have access to them for other uses. So there's a, another bite that you have access to, but you have to sign up for the website CourageousConversations.us and go there. Also, there's a resource table sitting over in this corner. There's a glossary of terms that we'll be using during the course of our time together. There's some of the things that are on the table which are clearly for you to take. There are other copies over there, another bite. And we're going to send you a survey. It's three questions. But we really want to know what we're up to and what you thought. It's more, it's five questions, well. I apparently lost that battle. <laughs> There's a copy of it on the table, but you don't have to fill it out unless you don't like getting them online. You can pick up one on the table, but you will receive it. That's another bite. And there's a next bite. If you are registered, because it too is sold out, on October 9th, Dr. Kristen Robinson will join us as we think about acting mindfully. If you are not registered and I've said it's sold out, then you'll still have access because when that video is pushed out, if you're signed up for the website, you will receive it. But as we get ready to end, I want you to take a daily bite of this meal, a daily bite. Aaron just said, if you practice something, as we were sitting and talking, if you practice something for two days, <laughs> You put it in your system in a way that it remains. So here's what we want you to practice. We want you to practice fear as a yellow light. The next time you are fearful, slow down. And imagine where that fear is coming from. Give yourself permission if it's 3.30 in the afternoon and you've not had a cookie. 
Give yourself permission if that stuff has come at you, but slow down and understand where it is and what it's from. And then seek to use that knowledge to know what to do next. That's the daily bite. Practice it every day. And let's see what we can do to make the choice to be courageous. You're courageous for being in this room. We are grateful for your presence. We look forward to the rest of this journey. To my colleagues on the planning team, Jess and Claire Mann. We're going drinking, by the way, just in case you want to know. Um, we look forward to what's next. Thank you, White House. Thank you, sponsors. This is just the beginning. The best is yet to come. Be safe tonight, everybody.